Corinth had an extraordinary reputation among the Greeks. It was a city of Aphrodite, goddess of love. It was believed to be a city of unimaginable luxury, of sexual license. Even the pastries of Corinth were considered to be the best and most luxurious in the Greek world. The Corinthians had made themselves a wealthy people through being the, near this isthmus. They charged tolls for all the other Greeks who wanted to come to the isthmus from east or west and then haul their ships overland to get to the other body of water, following, in the days before the canal, a thing called the diolkos, the hauling across place, which was a trackway carved into the stone with things that looked a little like railway tracks in it, and there were great carts onto which an entire ship could be loaded for that hauling across. People thus avoided the dangerous capes at the southern tip of the Peloponnese, capes like Teneron and Malia, Malia being so dangerous there was a saying, abandon hope when you approach Cape Malia. That was the spot where Odysseus got blown off course in Homer's Odyssey when he was trying to get home, it took him another nine years to make it. The Corinthians originally had a fabulously beautiful city. In order to get some idea of the glory of Corinth, I recommend starting by penetrating the modern city of Corinth and going straight through to the gigantic Acropolis on the far side, the southern side. This Acropolis, called the Acrocorinth, High Corinth, puts all other Acropolis, including the one in Athens, to shame. And I strongly recommend, unless you want a really stiff athletic workout, that you go by car or by bus as high up its slope as you can to a little parking area near one of the gates into the summit area of the Acrocorinth. We can see a spring, now in an underwater spring house, called Pyrene, famous in Greek lore as the place where the winged horse Pegasus struck the rock with his hoof and allowed these magical waters to come out. We can also see that temple of Aphrodite where women would worship the goddess partly through sexual services to men, getting Corinth a reputation that had lasted down to the time of Paul the Apostle and the early Christians as a center for sin and iniquity. Enjoy that view from the Acro Corinth and look at the amazing fortifications, classical Greek, through the Byzantine, Franks from the era of the Crusades, the Venetians, successive conquerors all left their mark on this seemingly impregnable hill. And all those views to take in in every direction, north to the Gulf of Corinth, southward into the Peloponnese itself. But you're going to want to get down very soon into Corinth itself. It appears to be from the Acro Corinth a large spread of ruins lying there at the foot of the mountain. But in fact, you're in for a disappointment if you think it's going to yield you anything like the wonders of Athens, where so much of the classical Greek architecture has been preserved. Corinth paid a terrible price during the period when Rome was steadily conquering the Eastern Mediterranean. There was a time when it appeared that the Greek states might be able to hold out and maintain their independence against the expansion of Rome. Corinth defied Rome in the second century BC and paid the price when in the year 146 BC, the conquering Romans leveled the city to the ground. Almost everything except a few sacred structures was destroyed without trace. So we can see less of ancient Corinth than almost any other comparably important site from the ancient Greek world. Nonetheless, to visit the Agora, the civic center of ancient Corinth, is still a very moving experience. For one thing, as you will see when you come to this Agora, the sort of gateway into ancient Corinth for the modern visitor, there are the remains of an extraordinary temple, not to Aphrodite, but to her half-brother, Apollo. Look closely at those Doric columns. They are extraordinary in that they are monolithic. You remember the Parthenon columns were made of separate drums stacked one on top of the other. These are single shafts of marble still holding high a number of their Doric capitals and pieces of the architrave that span the tops of those columns. 
Beyond that, as you will see, parts of the ancient theater of Dionysus were spared by the Romans. But here we begin to see a process of Romanization. The Romans weren't happy with just a place for plays, tragedies, comedies. They wanted action. So they arranged to flood the ancient theater of Dionysus, the playing area, so they could have violent mock sea battles, just as they had ultimately in the Colosseum back home, right there in what had been the theater of Dionysus in Corinth. When you get to the site museum for Corinth, you will see lots of beautiful Roman mosaics. They're beautiful, but to me they signal something very sad in the history of Greek civilization. Back in the glory days of the Golden Age, for Corinth, a great mother city of colonies, a city with a very active citizenship who joined in the government of their city-state and who made many ventures abroad, both military and colonizing. That was a time where, as in Athens, there were no rich houses, no private individual invested in his home. Their investment was in their city. The monuments that we can still see in Athens, the monuments that the Romans destroyed in Corinth, were gifts to the city from its own citizens, who could think of no better use for their wealth than to beautify the place where they lived and delight their fellow citizens. All that changed with the Roman ways. They went for what the Romans typically went for after the empire came in. After all, there isn't much political participation in an empire on the part of anybody except the ruler himself and his governors. So people retreated into their own homes, wealthy people beautified those. You'll see some of those fantastic Roman mosaics from homes of the wealthy in Corinth during the time of the Roman Empire, beautifully displayed in that little site museum by the Agora.